the show, Fighting for Social and Economic Justice, and we're here to talk about specific topics tonight. Uh, one topic we're going to hit very hard is the Congress, the U.S. Congress. What is the congressional elections about? Uh, what are they about? How do they differ from the presidential election, which is getting all the attention, and very little attention by the mass public is uh, put onto the Congress itself, and how we elect members of Congress, and why we elect them, and what kind of power do they have? It's the first branch of government in the Constitution. It's Article One. Article One of our Constitution deals with the establishing of the Congress and what it's there for and the rules and regulations the way, by which it would run. Article Two deals with the U.S. presidency. Article Three deals with the Supreme Court. So that's interesting how those sequence, that sequence there, if it's significant or not, we don't know exactly. But we do know that in the first hundred years of the United States history, Congress was the dominant branch, and I believe the founders intended it to be. Uh, the dominant branch, because they were coming off of a parliamentary system in Britain in which the legislature, the parliament, which is like our Congress, dominates fully. Uh, so they gave the Congress lots of powers, including the power to declare war against other countries. Congress and only Congress can declare war against other countries. Congress and only Congress can actually fund the war. The president can only ask for funding. He can only ask for a declaration of war, and they may or may not give it to him. A lot of restrictions put on the president recently with the War Powers Act, which we could talk about a little later perhaps, maybe even tomorrow. But today I wanted to focus on how people get elected to Congress. Why do they run for Congress? What kind of power does Congress have? And we'll start with the elections. That's where we're in the middle of elections right now, congressional elections and the presidential election. If you look at the two houses of Congress, they are co-equal. The U.S. Senate is called the upper house from tradition, and the U.S. House of Representatives is called the lower house out of tradition. But they're co-equal houses. They both have to pass the bill for it to become law. Furthermore, these are people are elected to the House of Representatives from various states throughout the Union, all the states, uh, based on the population of the state. That means the state of California with a very large population, the largest population in the United States. We have the largest number of seats in the House of Representatives. We have 53 representatives in the House. Whereas in the U.S. Senate, every state has two senators, regardless of the, of the size of the state. So a small little uh, Vermont in population size, a small state, has two U.S. senators in the Senate, and California, a huge state with 36 million people, also has about has only two senators. So that's the, the rule for the Senate. And yet a bill has to go through both houses for it to become law eventually, after the president signs it. Or if he vetoes it, the Congress gets to actually override the veto of the president if they want to, and pass a law without the president's agreement, without him consenting, even against his veto. As recently, a bill was passed to allow the 9-11 victims of the 9-11 uh, terrorist attack to be able to sue the government of Saudi Arabia in the United States court. And that goes against what we call sovereign immunity of nations. It's against international law, but it was certainly a very popular position for Congress members to take to say that, yes, the 9-11 victims have a right to sue the Saudi government to see if, if there's any evidence that they were involved, even though the 9-11 commission actually said that they had investigated the Saudi government and found no evidence that they were involved either officially as a government or government officials themselves. Um, there were individuals from Saudi Arabia who were involved with that attack, of course. 15 out of 19 hijackers were from Saudi Arabia on those airplanes. So it became a very uh, contentious issue when the Congress passed the law and President Obama vetoed it just a couple of weeks ago. And then Congress actually overrode the veto. They passed by, by an over two thirds majority a vote to go ahead and implement that law against President Obama's veto. So you can see Congress has a tremendous amount of power Matter of fact, the federal budget is spent by Congress. The president can only ask the Congress to spend so much money on education, so much on health care, so much on transportation, so much on defense. And it's up to Congress to decide whether they're going to give them all that amount of money in each of those areas, or maybe cut back on some areas and add to other areas. Uh, so Congress has a tremendous amount of power, the power of the purse, the power to originate tax bills in the House of Representatives and continue to the Senate with it and to pass it and to pass the tax laws, even if the president does not agree with them, they can override him. But he can also veto a budget or a tax bill and get Congress to reshape it. Uh, let me give you some nuts and bolts from the inside, because I, I did run for Congress a few years back on a grassroots campaign with no corporate money, refusing lobbyist money, refusing uh, PAC money from corporate entities. I only accepted uh, people, the money from working people and individuals and public interest groups like environmental groups and labor groups, when they did uh, offer to help, we accept their help. But we refused to take corporate PAC money in my campaign in 1998, and yet I won the primary on a grassroots basis. I also won 45% of the vote 
on the Democratic side, Iran is a Democrat, 45% of the, of the vote to the Republican incumbents, 52% of the vote. Dr. Steve Horn, who was a former president of Cal State University right here in our district, a very prestigious person with his uh, very, very well known. I ran a grassroots campaign with lots of volunteers from various community organizations, volunteering from church groups, individuals from church groups, from college classes uh, throughout the uh, area, from high school. Some of the high school students got involved as well. So we had a real grassroots campaign. Uh, we ran a Bernie Sanders type campaign uh, way before Bernie Sanders ran for president in that regard. But Bernie himself was running grassroots campaigns in Burlington, Vermont, and around that even earlier than that. So this is an amazing uh, role model, Bernie Sanders' campaign, but also Senator Paul Wellstone. That's who I actually modeled my campaign uh, the, uh, along the, the lines of which, who did not accept corporate money in Minnesota. Senator Wellstone had never served public office before. He had been involved with community organizing, with grassroots organizing for labor movement, environmental movements, for the rights for women, equality, and other kinds of issues that he was really a progressive. Senator Paul Wellstone ran also without corporate money, outspent seven to one, and he beat Rudy Boschwitz, the incumbent Republican, by about a little over a percent of the vote. And that was a grassroots campaign. I ran the same type of campaign in 1998 in the Long Beach area and came very close, 45 to 52 against the incumbent who'd already been in office, 45 to 52. And uh, we wanted to talk a bit about the inside picture, the inside story of the campaign, how it works. Let me tell you how our campaigns have become in America. Uh, as I write in my book, I say, the heart, the soul, and the mind of politics have been taken out of it. The heart, soul, and mind have been taken out of politics. Instead, it's become a mechanical venture just to win as many votes as the candidate can, doing whatever he has to do legally and stretching the limits to get elected, taking money from whatever source they can get, raise the money from whether it's corporate sources or lobbyists, and then go out and raise a huge amount of money. In fact, today the average person who wins a seat to Congress, the average member of Congress who's usually the incumbent, and the incumbents win 95% of the time. Uh, the incumbent, of course, is someone who's already in office, right? He's running for re-election. So these folks raise the most amount of money. The average winning candidate raises and spends $1.7 million every two years to win a House seat. Out of the 435 House seats, each congressperson on the average spends $1.7 million to get elected and re-elected. And it can be an incumbent most of the time, but once in a while, a challenger who's not in office already will win, or someone not in office with an open seat will win. But he also or she has to spend $1.7 million average to raise that and spend it every two years to get elected and re-elected. That's the way the system is set up right now. And you can see why that's rife for corruption, for legalized bribery, where these $1.7 million every two years means you've got to be on the telephones every day of the year, even between your elections, half, half the day on the phones begging for money, or going to very elaborate fundraisers, people at millionaires' homes and even organized groups, places and offices, and raising millions of dollars in that way, 1.7 million to be exact on the average. And this is how the money is spent. It's spent on very expensive public opinion polling. Uh, you hire a pollster as a candidate, you get one assigned to you from your campaign, your party that uh, has uh, several people you can choose from, or your your, your people who you know who are running your campaign will bring in a pollster, a polling director, who then takes a public opinion poll using a sample of between 500 to 1,500 voters in your district, which is a re representative sample of the voting population. So, for example, that voting population will have 51% women in it among the sample because that's how many women there are in America and probably in our district. So you'd want to have 49% men. If, it's a, if you're going in a dead Democratic primary, we want to make sure that you represent all the different democratic groups in that sample. And so then the pollsters and his assistants start calling these, uh, these public, this what we call the sample public, and making phone calls to them and asking them questions like such as, what are your three most important issues in this election? That's the first question. And so the polling, uh, the person on the other end of the phone line will answer, uh, my main issue is to have make sure we have good jobs in America right now because our jobs are being taken overseas. Or perhaps he'll say the second most important issue to me is making sure our education system works very well. So you have jobs, education, and the third one might be uh, the issue of immigration, that we protect legal immigrants or that we make sure legal immigrants don't uh, come in to the country. It depends on who you're, you're surveying. That's what I'm saying. The, the opinions are very varied in the district. 
if you're looking at Democratic voters, they're probably going to be more concerned about jobs, education, and health care. When you're interviewing other voters, that, that, that by the way, that priority of three, those three priorities might just be for mostly women uh, in the ages of 20 to 50 who are Democratic women. They would have a different view on what the three most important issues are. So while some men may say it's jobs, education, and health care, uh, women might say it's jobs, education, and choice on abortion, or perhaps health care and education and choice. Uh, they may have other issues like the environment. So what you have is in these pollsters, they come up with what's called cross tabs. They find out what are the top three issues for various subgroups in the electorate that you're going to be mailing to in order for you to win that primary. So let's say that women between 20 and 40 list education, health care, and choice as their top three issues. You will, the designer of the brochures, who's also a professional, will design the brochure with beautiful graphic design and artist will come in and make beautiful pictures in the brochure and they'll have one issue only on one brochure, one of those three issues. That will be mailed out in the second or third week before the election. And but before that, they'll even have another brochure about the candidate, building up the candidate as this great guy that was born in a log cabin and grew up very hardworking and made it to the middle, got, went to school and studied hard, became a professor or whatever. And then he goes on and they build him up. And then they come up with the first issue, such as the issue of health care. And they put that on one brochure and mail it to all 50,000 women in the district who are registered voters who voted the last several times, mail it to them only, and you mail it to those groups of women between 20 and 40. If it's the healthcare issue, you want to go with a broader group. You want to go with women between 20 or 18 and 60, because uh, all of them are concerned, or 18 and 80, uh, concerned about healthcare, but especially the people who don't have Medicare yet. So you target the mailing to various groups based on what they want to hear and what they're most concerned about. And you don't mail the same brochure to all the groups of voters. You may want to target male voters based on the poll, blue collar male voters, with the issue of certainly job outsourcing, how we could stop the job outsourcing and bring back manufacturing jobs, or have retraining programs to have highly skilled jobs replace the ones that they lost. And those same men, blue collar men, in the between 40s and 60s, you target that group with a second issue in a different mailer that deals with the issue of, let's say, immigration or a third mailer with the issue of uh, rebuilding our infrastructure or stopping us or keeping us safe. That's not a major issue right now. Many Americans are afraid of what's going on in the world. And sometimes they're, uh, they want to know that someone can protect them and the government can protect them or the president is willing to protect them or Congress will vote for the right things to get the funding to defend ourselves. It all depends on how these issues are portrayed in the public, in the public media, the private corporate media to the public, and then how the public holes in their hearts and minds these different issues. So what the pollster is concerned about is finding out exactly what different groups of voters in your district want as their top issues and then mailing them brochures, uh, targeting them to be able to get that message out over a period of two weeks before the election or three weeks and then that time is the time people are focusing on the candidates. So it's a very targeted Madison Avenue approach today. In fact the brochures that go out in congressional campaigns in California uh, the brochures are very vacuous. They are beautiful, glossy brochures with wonderful pictures in them. The picture takes up about 90% of the page. At the bottom of the page, you'll say, it'll say, um, uh, Jim Jones or Rachel Smith, the candidate for education, the education candidate. That's it. Vote for her on November the 8th. That's it. One line. And you have a beautiful picture of uh, Rachel Smith uh, kissing babies at a child care center. Uh, this is the education candidate because she loves babies and she wants the babies to grow up educated. Or you have a man doing the same thing, a male candidate. Or a woman speaking to a college class and adoring, um, inspired students looking up to her uh, in the lecture hall and then saying this uh, Miss Rachel Smith is the best candidate for America because she's the best for our education and she'll make sure your child is educated. Very vacuous statements, no plans, detailed plans in terms of how are you going to pay for the educational needs? What are the defects of our system right on education? What are the needs? What must be addressed? How should you bring funding in to address those needs, whether they be building and keeping up our school infrastructure or having more science labs and maintaining the arts programs? None of that stuff is brought in. None of that stuff is brought in the brochure. Just say you're for education. That's what the experts tell you. And mostly our, our campaigns are run this way. Look at the 30 second commercial on television, run by not only congressional candidates in some rural states, 
but also run by especially presidential candidates. 30 second soundbite commercials that quite often are negative campaigning against the other candidate to drive down their numbers, especially if your candidate is not that popular. You want to drive the other candidate down by just giving negative um, stories about his life or his character or her character. So this is the kind of campaigns that we have degenerated into. Madison Avenue taken over the propaganda machine of campaigning uh, throughout the United States for all these different offices, especially for the higher offices of the U.S. House, the U.S. Senate, and the presidency. A Madison Avenue type campaign to use propaganda to get as many votes as you can regardless of what you have to say. And if you have to change your message to different audiences, you have a different message, that's fine. That's the way you win votes. That's what these people tell you, these professional hired, um, hired guns, so to speak, who get paid big money to run campaigns. The polling director, the campaign manager, the campaign consultant, the scheduler, all these people is like a machine that takes a candidate, packages him or her, and just sells them as a product to the American people. And it's no wonder the voter turnouts are so low. In congressional elections, we have a 35% voter turnout. 35% of eligible voters in America are voting for the highest office of our land, the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate, the office that determines the purse, how the money will be spent in America, and who it will be spent on, and what it will be spent on, is elected. Uh, those offices in the Congress are elected by only 35% of our eligible population who could vote. Some of them are registered, some could register but are not, and only 35% are registered and actually do vote for the House of Representatives uh, and the U.S. Senate in midterm elections. In presidential elections every four years, we're lucky if we get 50 or 51 or 52% voter turnout of all the eligible voters. So this is a real shame, and there's a real reason it's this way, because our campaigns have left the proud traditions of the Stephen, uh, sorry, the Douglas, Lincoln-Douglas debates. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, Stephen Douglas, the, uh, two men who ran for the U.S. Uh, Congress several times against each other, and it was tremendous. The debates would last several hours in a day. People would bring their picnic baskets and take it easy and listen to these words and be inspired by them while they're enjoying their food as well as talking to each other on the side, but discussing the ideas that are being discussed from the stage. And this was an incredible, incredible way of really knowing the candidates personally and having them uh, answer questions in depth about issues. What did we get this time around? We're two weeks away from our presidential election. What have we gotten in terms of really good discourse, uh, critical thinking, inspirational discourse about the future of our country in specific areas? The areas of how we're going to take care of our people's health and health care. How are we going to, how is the president uh, going to work with Congress to bring us education that's totally affordable and totally equitable and free of charge for all of our young people to go all the way through medical school? That issue is never addressed directly by these general election candidates that are on television. Of course, there are two other candidates that you don't get to hear on television, and at least one of those two is addressing those issues. So we need to really put these candidates' feet to the fire and get them out there in front of us at these town hall meetings that we should set up and demand from them that they come on and tell us what are they actually going to do. And that way we have it in writing, we have it recorded if we need to record it, and then we will hold them to it once they're elected and ask them what happened. Uh, this is three years later, this is three months later, this is three years later, and the, we have the same problems that have not been solved. So will you tell us why we should re-elect you? That's called accountability in political science voter account candidate accountability to the voters and accountability is a big part of legitimacy of, of helping strengthen the system as a legitimate system of rule of government that cares about people and that should have the right to rule that's called legitimacy and it's based on accountability it's based on clear-cut issue positions clearly delineated issues and platforms from the platform of the, of the party and of the candidate to tell the voters specifically what they believe and to also hear from the voters what the voters want and need what are the voters' concerns? And there should be a synthesis of the candidate's view with the voters' concerns and put that together in a platform that, that encompasses a vision, a vision for the country's future, for the state of California's future, that the voters can take and decide whether they agree with it or not. And then they can decide which vision is better, the vision of this candidate or that candidate, the vision of the more progressive candidate or the more conservative one, or, the, or maybe a third candidate or fourth who has a better vision overall. And don't forget what the scriptures say, that where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. So without a vision, without a certain uh, sense of where we want to go as a nation, as a family of Americans, where we want to go in terms of the future and the present, 
and how we want to take our young people there and ourselves there. That vision, if it's not there, we're going to be sailing without uh, a compass and we're going to be blindsided. And we need to really put our country back on track again, put those sails up again and go and tack the way we need to to get this country on the right track and moving the right direction uh, as a wonderful enterprise that I think could inspire human beings, could inspire the world. It has done that before. We've had leaders like President Franklin Roosevelt, who was a tremendous inspiration to Americans in their darkest hour of the Great Depression, and the world as well, who heard about how he was trying to lead this country out of it and did successfully got us out of it. Um, the inspiration that he gave us with his Economic Bill of Rights, in which he said that the rights to free speech, the free press, and freedom of religion, the political Bill of Rights are very important. They were certainly there at, founding, at the founding time of our nation, but they're not only enough. We have to have an Economic Bill of Rights. That was part of President Roosevelt's vision to take us to a situation where we can guarantee the right to a good job with a, a good potential, good wage for the working people, the right to a fair profit for small business, he said, the right to make a profit and compete with big business without being crushed by monopolies, the right to an education, said President Roosevelt, is one of the Economic Bill of Rights, bills of right. the right to uh, having health care where when you get sick and ill so we can recover and continue with our pursuit of happiness. These, this is the vision that FDR talked about. And there were many non-politicians, such as Dr. Martin Luther King, who was a tremendous leader and inspirational person as an individual, uh, using spiritual principles to help uplift us to a much better place as a nation. And Dr. King had a vision. As we know, we talk about Dr. King's dream. Well, it was a dream based on a vision. And that dream was not just of equality in terms of race and ethnicity, which was a very important part of his vision. We have to have racial and ethnic equality for any humane or humanistic society. That's a that's a fundamental requirement, but we got to go beyond just race and ethnicity. We have to go to economic equality. Dr. King, when he was so brutally gunned down in Memphis on April 4th, was in Memphis to fight for and to speak for the sanitation workers, some of the lowest paid, the most dangerous jobs that were around for these people to do, and yet they had to do it, and they wanted to do it, but they wanted to have dignity when they did it, and have a living wage when they did it, and not be in danger of getting crushed by the machinery of the uh, trash hauling trucks. These were safety issues, there were economic issues and survival issues that Dr. King was fighting for, for these folks who were working people without whose work we could never live healthily, without those sanitation workers, we would having, be having disease all over the place, especially at that time in Memphis. So Dr. King understood the dignity of work, of every type of work, not just the work of a rocket scientist or of a, an engineer or professor, but the work of people who work with their hands people who work with their hearts and minds to design uh, products that we need to help make our lives easier. And also people who inspire us in their work to think about what the possibilities are, to inspire us with the arts, to show us as human beings that art can take us to places we've never been before. Those kind of folks, the artists are so important as workers as well, cultural workers. So work is dignity. And we need to make sure in this country, in this presidential election, that the president and Congress really, really work hard to get us the work that we need so our lives will be meaningful and we'll be able to live uh, in a humane and a human way to be able to raise our children, have the money for our rent or to buy a home, have the money for our food, healthy food, not GMO foods, but healthy organic foods preferably, and all kinds of food that we can enjoy. Travel, vacation time, those things that uplift our spirit, uh, playing uh, baseball with our kids or going out to baseball games. Uh, that recreation time with our children to love and nurture them. All of that is part of having a good, high paying job for every American. And that can be done. That can certainly be done because this country produces more wealth and income than any other country in the history of humankind. It just has to be distributed more fairly and equally. And that's what it's all about. So that's what this program is about the fighting for economic and social justice. And don't forget, environmental justice is a very big part of social justice. And we've got to fight for these things, especially to prevent. This horrendous climate change that's occurring right now, which can end up destroying our civilization. We know it. Just heard this morning on some research program, a radio program that brought up some recent research, that the ice in the Antarctica is melting much faster than we thought. The ice shelves in Antarctica, which is causing it's melting underneath the shelves that come off of the actual continent, and it's causing the water to rise. And the warming of the waters from the rising ice in the North Pole is actually uh, causing the, the ice in the South Pole to melt as well now. And this is just tremendously important for the survival of our planet. 
So we have the capability to figure out how to do this through engineering, through, uh, lo through a more safe and uh, proper consumption of products that we need, but not what we don't need. We've got to, to look at our lifestyles. We, we can certainly uh, live a good life and live a healthy life and a pleasurable life, a lot of free time, if we just become integrated as, as parts of, our, of the environment, not people who capture and who are to rule over and exploit the environment, but those of us as humans to be a part of our environment, as Chief Seattle and many, many Native people have spoken about. Chief Seattle, uh, a Native tribe leader in the Washington State area, many years ago said that we must make decisions at this time, the time he was living, we must always make decisions in our lives that will take into consideration the next seven generations. Every decision that we make, whether it's a personal, political, economic decision, environmental decision, must consider the benefit and the sustainability of the next seven generations, not just the next generation. So keep that in mind and let's go ahead and see if we can have a few phone calls come in. Hopefully folks are out there listening and you'd like to call in and talk and give us your ideas about these things we've been speaking about. So please feel free to call the phone number on the screen, 562-438-0505, 562-438-0505. And then we'll be taking up your call, picking it up and answering, and then we'll have you speak. You'll be able to hear yourself on the broadcast as well. I thought it was very important we bring in the Congress and look at how Congress is elected, look at the powers of some of the powers of Congress, and how important it is that an, institu an equal institution to the presidency, even though the media seems to focus almost exclusively on the presidency. So we'll continue with that as we go along this week. Thank you. There's a phone call coming in. Let's see who this is. Hello, good evening. This is Peter Matthews. Who's there, please? Hi, this is Frank calling. How are you doing? Oh, is this Frank? Yes, uh -huh. Yes, my friend. How are you doing, sir? All right, all right. Uh, What's on your mind? What's on your mind today, Frank? How we can make sure that Hillary Clinton does what she is promising right now? For example, College uh, education, mostly free, for, uh, you know, people who are making less than 125000 mm -hmm. And secondly, free uh, $10 million that she promised. What's going to happen if Congress doesn't go along with her? What are we going to do? Excellent question. In other words, the, uh, the crux of the question is, how are we, the people, going to make sure that if Hillary Clinton is elected and she's president, how are we going to ensure that she will carry out her promises, such as to bring in 10 million jobs to help with unemployment problems, to bring in tuition-free education for all Americans whose parents make under $125,000 a year, which, by the way, is at least 95% of the American people. So she has uh, promised these things in her platform. How do we ensure that she will be able to carry these through, uh, especially since Congress has to agree with those things, am I right? Before they can, this can become policy, Congress has to implement these into law. We have a uh, Republican Congress in the Senate, and she's not going to do anything because they're not going to initiate the uh, legislation for her to sign. Well, there is a Republican Congress right now. That's the majority Republicans in the House and Senate. Uh, and yet, when there was a majority of Democrats back in 2008 to 2010 under President Obama, even then it was difficult to get many of these things through. Uh, so it, it's a question of not just Republican or Democrat, it's a question of members of Congress serving the public interest as opposed to the wealthy special interest that helped them get elected. So while Ms. Clinton might be able to, and maybe she'll change uh, from her past uh, concerns about serving mostly the people who are donating to her in a lot of ways, but she also helped the public to some extent, but she did take a lot of money from Wall Street when she was in the U.S. Senate from other places. So maybe she'll move away from that now that she's president, if she becomes president in two weeks, and start pursuing the public interest more fully. Am I right? But how do we, the people, get her to do that? Because she will not do that on her own. She has taken money from some of the same interests. She must see that the people are leading the way and that she cannot get reelected unless she does these things. And then the second problem is Congress, as you said, because it may still be a Republican majority Congress, which will make it very difficult, or it may even be a majority Democratic Congress, but corporate Democrats dominating the Democratic Party in Congress. And then you got members of Congress who are bought and paid for or funded fully by these corporate interests. And if they're Democrat or Republican, it wouldn't matter too much because they seem to want to drag their feet and not get things done for the regular American people, the 99%. It's back to the old idea of 1% versus 99%. So how do we get Congress to do this, Frank? You tell me. Well, the people like us can align 
and serve, and then we're going to fulfill the promise. And then we need to put pressure on our local congressmen to fight and make deal with the Republican Congress to see if we can get some of these resolutions passed. You know, in the past, people in New York made deals with Ron Reagan to grab, you know, so that Reagan got some of his program passed, and then we maintained some of the Democratic programs. Now we have for us to work together where the uh, people who were behind the Tea Party movement have just basically stopped the government from doing anything for the last eight to ten years. And the Tea Party was funded primarily by the Koch brothers, the very wealthy oil men out of Kansas, I believe it is. And the Tea Party had an agenda. They stuck to their ideas, which was mainly tax cuts on the rich, expanding businesses that way, supposedly, by having a trickle-down economic theory. And uh, they also shut the, helped shut the government down because they wouldn't compromise. So you're right about this. The only way we can do is if we the people, Frank, as you and me and other folks out there on the ground are ready to act, are ready to start planning on how we're going to contact our members of Congress once this election's over, the new Congress, and start saying, listen, Mr. Congressperson or Ms. Congressperson, you serve us, we pay your salary, and we do believe you should carry out the wishes of the American people and that what's better for our people and not just the few wealthy special interests that elected you, that funded you. So it's got to be up to us to organize, and not just for the Congress, but for Hillary Clinton as well. We have to let Hillary Clinton know. Pardon me? I don't have a problem with, you know, the government officials doing what the rich people want. No, after the rest of the years, they are middle class and the poor. There's nothing wrong with taking care of the rich and the middle class and the poor, anybody. It's just like these congressmen are not working for uh, middle class and the poor, they're just working for the rich. Because that's where the money is coming from. And that's that's it. Rich, you, know that's... What? you got your share of the pie, now let us you know, get our share of the pie. Well, much of this cannot happen unless you have true campaign finance reform, unless you have a constitutional amendment to uh, to get money out of politics. That's the private money is what's causing this problem that you're mentioning in both parties. And so we have to move toward that also while we're organizing on the ground to get our members of Congress to behave the right way, to promote the general welfare as the Constitution requires, the general welfare, the general well-being of our people, not just a few. So I think you're right. We can have the country go forward if it works together, but for too long, the wealthy 1% has not been working together for the benefit of the public good. And the members of Congress and the presidency quite often have basically have to consider their wishes. They've considered the wishes of the 1% far more than the 99%, and so that's got to change. So I think we should keep this... Let's keep this broadcast going after the election. Frank, what do you think? Yeah, we have to keep this going and then we can uh, organize. Yes. So that uh, Hillary Clinton does her, fulfill her promise, promises, those two important them, and then the congressmen are fighting and negotiating and working deal with the Republicans. Okay. The so basically you're saying the election is over. You're saying Hillary Clinton, you didn't call her President Clinton, but I think you're implying that she's the next president, right? So the election's yeah, over, basically. You're pretty much you're pretty much secure and safe in that understanding, in your view. Is that right? You believe yeah, Hillary Clinton's going to be the next president? We don't have a plan. We don't have a plan. This is all a waste of time and energy. Okay, let's suppose this, though. Let's suppose that Hillary Clinton doesn't get elected by some outside chance, that she does not get elected, but Donald Trump does. Do we just go back home and go to sleep, or do we keep on him also? Do we keep yeah, ourselves organized and make demands of Donald Trump to start serving the people of America, not just the 1%, which he's part of? Yeah, He's part of the one percent. Uh, Donald Trump. But what we need to do is start thinking about organizing and then start thinking and planning for who we're going to be fulfilling these policies. Because otherwise, nobody's going to make a deal, and she's going to go back to like any other politician and say, "Well, I don't need to do anything because the election is over." That's so true. So true, Frank. I think we're going to wait for another phone call coming in, buddy. Thank you so much for calling right. in. Appreciate Bye. the comments. Okay. Okay. There you heard it, folks. Frank called in today. He said that uh, it's time that we stay, the people stay organized on the ground level to ensure that the government will carry out its promises, especially in the forms of the president and even members of Congress. They promise a lot before the election, but when the election's over, it seems like the same old thing goes on. And that's a problem that he's recognized. And Frank says we got to stay organized, get more people involved in the movement, and keep a social movement, get a social movement going and keep it going. That'll keep these folks responsible. Oh, if any more phone calls would like to come in, go ahead and, and dial the number, folks. 562-438-0505, if you'd like. 562-438-0505. We're almost out of time, actually, but another minute or two left. If anyone would like to call in. 
Uh, we'll be happy to take the call. Oh, there's a call coming in. Let's see who that is. Good evening. Peter Matthews here. Who's calling, please? Hi, this is Brett Covey. I oh, yes, sir. I'm from Long Beach. You, you talked to me. Yesterday. Yes, I have. How are you doing, Brett? Uh, I'm doing just fine. What's uh, on your mind? I agree with you. We need, to, we need to stick together. I belong to a group called uh, Brand New Congress. Uh, they're kind of a lackluster group. Can you speak up a little bit, Brett, and say that name again? Did you say Brand New yeah, Congress? I, I call it. I mean, that's what they call it. Um, yeah. we're, we're working hard, but we're moving slow. We're growing slow. I think people, my idea is that people are frustrated and angry, and they're just kind of giving up. Some are some are on the verge of desperation, but um, I want to talk about the candidates. Okay. I don't believe either candidate is in any way fit for office. Uh, that doesn't include Jill Stein and Gary Johnson. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we both know that it's not going to happen for them. It's going to be Hillary or Trump. Or they're going to take Hillary out and replace her. But I, whatever we, we come up with, it's not going to, it doesn't sound like it's going to be real good. But at this moment, it is what it is. I signed up for the Sanders campaign, Bernie. Sanders' campaign only magnified the corruption that exists within the system. When the voter fraud is being flaunted in front of us now, and we don't seem to be able to do anything about it. The, and the fact that it was probably, probably it's gone on for decades. Uh, I joined to change America. Realistically, what can I do and others to change America and ensure the American dream is there for myself, my children? And for that matter, my grandchildren. Excellent. Excellent question and, and comments, too, would go with it. What can we do and you do realistically to change America so that to ensure that America will be here in a, in a good condition, better condition than what it is, for our children and our grandchildren? I believe we have to start with organizing, as Frank had said earlier, the earlier caller, that we've got to start getting people together into a mass movement. And we've got to educate each other about the issues. That's a very important part that quite a few activists um, sometimes don't focus too much on, the education part. Activists are very committed people who go to meetings. They have specific agendas to get accomplished for their specific issue in a given moment of time and a period of time. But they don't necessarily have all of the information they need to know about how the system is actually put together and how it works and how it's not working. And also the large philosophical concepts and ideals that underlie any given system. You can have something as horrible and pernicious as fascism or Nazism, as you had underlying the ideals of Nazi Germany or of fascist Italy, or you can have an ideal of liberal progressive democracy as President Roosevelt put forth in the United States. You can have social democracy as Bernie Sanders has put forth, he calls it democratic socialism. That's a set of ideas as well. That ha It's a vision for the country and that's been already been practiced. It's being practiced in much of Europe, in Northern Europe, in Norway, Finland, Denmark and Sweden and Germany and France and Western Europe as well. Many, many countries in Europe are practicing democratic socialism, as Bernie called it, although otherwise known as social democracy. So these sets of ideas are important to discuss in our activism, in our grassroots movement. So maybe we should have study groups that come together, or perhaps we could open this up to making this a study group on this half an hour on this show. I would get more people to call in, Brett, and if we have more lines, phone lines here and talk to each other in several lines, let's see if we can set that up te technically, Brett. What do you think? <laughs> there, there needs to be more people calling, and um, I would suggest that you extend the show to one hour. But we may have to do that, especially <laughs> as more mind. people get I involved. Don't mind time here on the phone. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> maybe it has to be a one-hour show. We'll have to move it to one hour. Let's see how it goes first with getting more people to call and give us their ideas and their thoughts and concerns and their inspiration. You know, they, we can we can learn from our public. We have to learn from the public. And the public are the regular folks that, that should drive this whole democracy, not the few elites. So it's about time to sign off tonight, but we will definitely do this, Brett. We'll do it tomorrow night again. And if you have any friends that would like to call in or give us some inspiration and education, we'll do it again. Well, I'm Tomorrow. telling people. Yes. You know, I don't know what's going to happen. But <laughs> Two weeks from tonight is, is the big day. 
The election. The election's two weeks, right? Two weeks from today. Yes. Say that again, Brett? I feel like I'm a part of this whole thing, so. Yes, absolutely you are. I mean, not just broadcast, but everything else. Right. I've known you for a while. You've been a movement leader here in your own way, and, and your knowledge in technology as well as your knowledge in politics and ideas is a tremendous uh, boon to this kind of movement. So well, we keep it going. Stop. Good for you. We're not. None of us are going to stop, no matter who gets elected on Tuesday, uh, two weeks from tomorrow. Uh, from today, actually. Tuesday, two weeks from today is the election, folks. Don't forget. And you, need, you needed to have registered to vote yesterday in California to be able to vote. Oh. On, uh, right. So... <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, okay. ladies and gentlemen. We'll say good night then. Thank you, Brett. Good night. All right, good night. Good talking to you folks. Please stay tuned. Uh, come in and tune in tomorrow, and let's go ahead and have more conversation, okay? Thank you.